Welcome to the March 2024 edition of Hunt Camp Mail. I hope you had the luck of the Irish this St. Patrick's Day. I know I did. By the time you watch this video, I'll be fishing my way through Utah, Idaho, and the state of Montana. And this is the time of year where the hatches start to happen and all of our western rivers and streams just come alive. It's one of my favorite times of year. My video about boar snakes that I did seemed to bring out every mall ninja and basement commando from coast to coast. And guys with names like Nutbuster, Robo Blaster, Minuteman, Glock Guru 69, and Patriot 911 made the comments for that video just a real shit show. So I had to clean things up and put comments on hold pending review for that video. It just kind of got out of hand. I didn't think people were going to get that crazy about boar snakes, but they did. As usual, I received some great letters this month, so let's get to March's mail. And our first question this month is from Dave in La Quinta, California. Dave wrote, Mr. Desert Dog, how would you tell what kind of barrel you have on a Ruger M77? And I, I've been asked this so many times, and I think I've answered it dozens of times already, but uh, I'll go ahead and give it one more go for you here, Dave. Uh, Ruger set up machinery to make their own barrels in about 1990, 1991, somewhere in that time frame. And they slowly phased in the new barrels. And by about 1992, all the barrels for the M77 Mark II were produced by Ruger in-house. But before that time, there was no way to tell who made your M77 barrel. You know, there were no special markings on the barrel for you to investigate and verify. When you buy an old M77, you know, you might get a crappy Wilson barrel that shoots like shit, or you might get a really good Douglas barrel. From uh, about 1968 to about the mid-70s, most barrels were the better Douglas barrels. And then from about the mid-70s to about 1990, most of the barrels were actually Wilson barrels. But the barrels aren't marked for any particular maker. And like I said in my M77 video that I did, Ruger sourced barrels from several places, and there's no way to tell what barrel you have before 1992. You know, the reality of buying an old M77 is that it's a real crapshoot. And our next letter is from Frank from Corona, California. Seem to get a lot of letters from Corona. There must be a lot of hunters there. Frank wrote, Desert Dog. Did you see the backfire video about the internet troll that he called out? As a matter of fact, I did. Uh, he called out a bunch of trolls on his channel to prove that they can shoot like they claim. He got one troll to show up, a Marine, and he embarrassed himself badly. You have always told us that most people on the internet have no clue and just talk a big game. You told us a couple months ago not to even listen to the comments in your own videos. If you watch the new Backfire video, you're going to laugh your ass off. This Marine was portraying himself as a skilled expert, but we found out that he had no idea how to shoot at all. You seem to have a very good BS detector. I certainly do. How do you tell the real deal from the pretender? <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Thanks for the letter, Frank. And someone sent me to that video in the comment section for my boar snake video, I believe. And I went over to the Backfire channel and I watched it in its entirety. You know, I still can't believe that he actually got a troll to show up on his show to shoot. <laughs> you know, kudos to Jim for making that happen and for putting all the fake experts on notice too. I saw another popular YouTube creator um, actually, I saw several other popular YouTube creators that actually commented on that backfire video as well, and it was pretty funny. Um, YouTube creators spend so much time going through bad advice, inaccurate information, trolls, threats, keyboard commandos, and experts that know better. You know, I think all firearm content creators got a kick out of backfire's video because that's kind of how we imagine a lot of uh, 
people on YouTube as being in real life, and that kind of verifies it. <laughs> After Backfire posted that video, a popular elk guide in eastern Wyoming decided to do a similar challenge himself based off of that Backfire video so he could prove how easy it is for an experienced shooter to do that challenge. And at the beginning of that video, that guy just bragged about how most of his kill shots are at 500 yards. And, you know, he always makes his kill shots at 500 yards. And he even claimed most of his clients are shooting that far. Then this expert shooter and professional guide goes prone in the dirt, just like he's hunting. And he proceeds to miss almost every shot past 300 yards. In fact, he missed his shots at 300 yards. You know, most of his uh, uh, 500 yard shots, you know, he claims he kills at 500 yards all the time, but most of his 500 yard shots were over a foot away from the milk jugs. I mean, they were way off, but in usual expert fashion, he admits that he needs to practice more, but then stated that all of those shots would have been kill shots on a real elk, you know, even though he was missing by two or three feet off the center of that milk jug. You know, kind of like how the guy in Backfire's video said that he felt comfortable shooting to 400 yards, even though, you know, he missed most of his shots at that distance. But uh, to your question, I actually thought hard on the topic of fake experts and trolls for a long time. And I really do try to understand their minds. So you, I think your question is deserving of a long and complex answer, which is not possible within the confines of Hunt Camp Mill, unfortunately. So I think I'll do a separate video on the topic maybe next month. So stay tuned for that. And our next letter is from Tyler. Tyler wrote, H4350 versus IMR4350. I just bought two small containers of both. What's the difference between these two powders? That's an easy one to answer, Tyler. The H4350 has a slower burn rate and, a different, uh, and different grain properties than IMR4350. So the load data between the two is not interchangeable. So don't try to do that. H4350 is also a hydrogen extreme powder, so it has very good temperature stability. I also seem to get more precise loads with H4350. So in my opinion, H4350 is just a better powder overall than IMR4350. But since you bought two canisters of each, you know, it wouldn't hurt to try them both out in your barrel. Try to develop loads with each and see what it likes the best. And our next letter is from Eric in Georgia. Eric wrote, I'm a gunsmith in Southeast Georgia for 30 years. On a few occasions, customers brought in rimfire guns that were hitting with insufficient force to fire the cartridge. Upon inspection, the firing pin had more than adequately slammed a deep groove into the unfired cartridge. When I test fired with my own ammo, they fired every time. Each time, I asked how they kept their ammo. All of them stated the ammo was haphazardly tossed about or kept in a loose rattling can. <coughs> Excuse me. Many years ago, I asked an ammo manufacturer why some rounds do not fire. They said the primer compound will fall out of the rim if the cartridge is handled roughly. I tell all of my clients that I don't charge a diagnostic fee should there be nothing actually wrong with their gun. Well, I hear what you're saying, Eric, but I think what you're actually seeing is the difference between cheap ammo and quality ammunition. You know, here's a box of uh, Remington Thunderbolts, and I got a whole brick of this stuff, and this has been stored carefully indoors in a temperature-controlled environment inside of a sealed ammo can. In addition to some of the misfires due to uh, priming issues, I can actually pull these cartridges apart with my hands. You know, if I measure rim thickness, bullet weight, and powder charge on this ammo, 
It's just going to be all over the place. Really good 22 long rifle ammunition doesn't have these problems. And our next letter is from Toby from South Africa. Toby wrote, I recently inherited a Ruger M77 and 7mm Remington Magnum. I came across your video on the internet and would like to confirm the torque pound values for the gun. I had my gun at the gunsmith. When I got the gun back, it was shooting all over the place. I took it to a local gun shop and the guy loosened the three screws on the bottom and retightened. He started from the trigger side first, 30 pounds torque, then went to the front screw, also 30 pounds, and the middle screw, also 30. He went back to the range and it shot closer groups. Your video says you should start from the front screw, 90 pounds, then the trigger screw, 50 pounds, and the middle, I'm not sure what pound torque. Could you please advise on this torque? I was wondering, since the gun shoots good, shoots good groups now, should I leave it as is, or should I take the gun back to the local gun shop and have them redo the screws? Well, Toby, your gun shop is tightening your action completely wrong. And, you know, it's over tightening that middle screw by a lot and probably causing other issues. What you should do is snug all three of the screws down. And then when you do the final torque, you always torque that front screw first. The front screw is the most critical screw because it controls the recoil lug and it locks the action down into that receiver flat. So the rear screw, you know, basically all that does is hold the rear tang down firmly and the middle screw should just be snug. If you over tighten that middle screw, you'll cause something that's known as torque stress, where you're basically flexing the action in the middle and you don't want that. You know, even though Ruger says 90 to 95 inch pounds for the front screw, most inch pound torque wrenches don't go past 65 inch pounds. So it's very common for people to just torque that front screw to 65 inch pounds, torque the rear screw to about 30 inch pounds, and the middle screw to, you know, maybe 10 inch pounds, just snug. I recommend that you buy your own inch pound torque wrench and do the job yourself. Relying on some dude at a gun shop to properly set up your rifle is just a horrible idea. I guarantee you that the, the guy at that gun shop knows little to nothing about the Ruger M77. So you're better off dealing with that yourself. And our next letter is from Junior. And Junior didn't say where he was from, so he obviously doesn't watch a lot of hunt camp mail. Junior wrote, I picked up a pre-64 Model 70 at a gun show today that appears to be a national match in 30 6 from 1961. It seems to be all original except the barrel. I didn't know much about them and wondered what your opinion on them is. Well, that is a fine collector's item that you have there, Junior. Um, from the picture, the receiver is correct with the uh, stripper clip cutout. And guys who shot Palma matches back in those days like using stripper clips for reloads. So that's why that's there. The barrel on that isn't original, but you know most top competitors shot their barrels out and got new ones anyways, or just wanted a better custom barrel. But uh, the barrel on that is period correct. It has the proper front sight block, and you'll notice that it has a scope block mid-barrel to support those really long urinal scopes that were used back then for competition. And that gun is set up for a urinal scope. It also has the original steel butt plate on it, which is rare because many of those shooters back in the day replaced those with one of the uh, white line rubber recoil pads later. It also has the original stock with the uh, flat forend on it. There was less than 2,000 of those guns sold to the public. So at that time, those were considered to be probably the most accurate production rifles on the earth. And a lot of world records were set with those rifles. So that's a good find there, Junior. And our next letter is from Gurmit from Elk Grove, California. Gurmit wrote, 
Dear Desert Dog Outdoors, I enjoyed your vlog on the 300 h and &H. It was excellent. But I can't find Nosler, Norma, or Hornady Brass for 300 h and &H. If you have some to spare and are willing to sell, then I will send you a money order. Any assistance is appreciated. <laughs> Sorry, Gourmet. I don't sell reloading supplies. And I really don't do transactions uh, with anyone associated to YouTube that I don't personally know or have cut some kind of relationship with. But I did do a quick brass search for you. Over the last six months, I probably got about 20 emails from people building a 300 h and &H rifle. And for some odd reason, 300 h and &H is experiencing a huge surge in popularity right now. In December, 300 h and &H brass was just everywhere. And I sent links to buy that brass to several of my viewers. And even the Nosler website had 300 h and &H brass for sale on it. And this is in December. But I just checked again and 300 h and &H brass is sold out everywhere. You know, I'm just going to give you a piece of advice here, Gourmet. If you want to be a reloader, part of the game is buying supplies when they're available. Never wait until you need something to buy it. Always get supplies well before you need them. You know, this is the difference between an experienced reloader and a rookie. So when 300 h and &H brass is available again, stock up on this stuff. And our next letter is from Spencer in Kentucky. Spencer wrote, Desert Dog, I've been watching your channel for almost four years, and I just noticed something. We all call you Desert Dog, Dog of the Desert, Canine Alpha Guru, the Canine Anointed One, Pedro del Desierto, Des Dog, and more recently, Uncle Dog. I just now realized that we don't know your real name. In fact, you've never told us what city you live in. I feel like I know you but know nothing about you. I feel like you would be more popular if you used your real name like other YouTube personalities do. But, you know, that's a fair question and I see what you're getting at there, but I've always deliberately kept my personal information off of my channel. You know, even though I exude confidence and courage, I'm actually a very private person if you know me. You know, even my name, Desert Dog, has a deep personal meaning that I keep to myself. You know, information is really the only thing of value that we possess as human beings. And I feel like having my personal information out there has a higher potential for harm rather than good. And as you know, in one of my videos a few years ago, I panned the camera across an ice chest full of meat that I had at the airport. And I had my name and address written on that ice chest. And a real stalker basically froze a couple of those frames and was trying to come to my house. And, you know, I had to put an end to that. But the main reason I don't provide you with my real personal information is because I'm not really running this channel for fame or notoriety. I want this channel to be focused on the content and not me. You know, I, I really have no desire to be a celebrity or to take your money. You know, I just want to learn, teach, and enjoy the experience. And our next letter is from John in Houston, Texas. John wrote, I want to thank you for the great videos. I tell all my friends about your videos and the non-biased wisdom you share with other hunters. You did several that helped me solve a problem. I have the same Winchester rifle that was in the used rifle roulette video, but in 270 Winchester. I bought mine new. I could not get better than a three and a half inch group with any bullet combination that I loaded or with factory ammo. I changed my trigger for a Timney and lapped my scope rings. Although I did not skim bed the rifle, that was next on my list. As I watched all your videos, I referred back to the troubleshooting scope issues video 
and the Don't Destroy Your Scope video. I decided to simply change directions and change scopes as you indicated in the troubleshooting scope video. I took off my Leupold VX5 CDS scope and swapped it for a simple VX1 3x9. I went to the range and shot multiple half inch groups. It was nice to finally find the issue. I'm not sure what happened to the VX5 scope, but the rifle did fall over once when, after it was leaning against a tree. The scope is on its way back to Oregon now. Again, thank you for the shared wisdom and keep the content coming. I, I love letters like this, and I personally believe that out of all the videos I've done over the years, that the content I put out last December during scope month, I think that helped the most people. And I received so many comments and mail just like yours, John. You know, modern lightweight hunting scopes have so many durability issues these days that the scope is really kind of the first thing I troubleshoot if a rifle suddenly starts having issues these days. And I'm just humbled that my content help you save a great rifle from not being used again. So thank you for the letter. And our next letter is from John from Newark, Ohio. A lot of Johns this month. I've been stuck in my house all week from a foot injury, so I decided to watch some of your old videos. I felt like I went down a rabbit hole into Wonderland. I never knew hunters could be so weird. <laughs> I learned about 270 bots, naked German hunts, swamp doggies, illegal aliens versus space aliens, whale fishing, mythical steel, golden hordes, quail farts, skimmers, utards, and cactus munchers. Thank you for the laughs. <laughs> You know, you're welcome, and trust me, none of these things were even planned. Uh, they kind of happened organically through interactions with my viewers throughout the years. So I guess you could say that my viewers are pretty weird, but, uh, you know, I wouldn't have it any other way. And thanks for the walk down memory lane. And our next letter is from Reinhardt from South Africa. And Reinhardt wrote, I have a buffalo cow hunt in April, and I'm planning on using the 375 H&H &H Winchester Model 70, which I bought after watching your recommendations of the Model 70 Safari Express. My question is, I have a Zeiss Conquest V4 3-12 by 44 mounted on the 375, planning to shoot between 75 and 150 yards. Will this scope magnification be low enough, or do I need to get the Zeiss 1-4 to by 24? Well, the three power is perfectly fine for shooting between 75 and 150 yards like you stated. You know, it sounds like you're hunting in some pretty open country. And since it's a cow, you'll probably be hunting herd animals. And I think your setup is perfectly fine for what you plan to do. It's when you hunt the Dagaboys and the really thick Jess that a low powered optic with a true 1X magnification really shines, but I think you're good to go with what you have. And our next letter is from Stuart from Placentia, California. Stuart wrote, I have watched your hunting and gun videos for years, and I bought a Model 70 because of your recommendations, and I love that gun. My buddies drool over my gun. I also took hunter safety training and got my first hunting license three years ago because of your channel. Thank you. I watched a couple of your videos where you and your wife fly fish, both in the ocean and in rivers. Since we don't hunt for half the year, fly fishing seems like a great way to fill the gap between hunting seasons. Totally agree with you. And that's, that's what I do. I took a fly casting class here locally, and I think I'm hooked on fly fishing. You said that fly fishing is something you will never master, and my instructor told me the same thing. I plan to fish SoCal rivers and the Eastern Sierras like you did in your Owens Valley fishing video. You said that trout reels are just fancy line holders, so I plan on getting a cheaper Orvis reel. The fly rod part is very confusing to me though. What rod would you recommend 
for a beginner for trout fishing rivers and streams. My budget is currently $300 for a rod, but I'll buy better equipment once I become a better caster. It's a very good approach to fly fishing. Um, you know, there's basically three types of fishing you're going to do as a beginner for a trout in our western rivers and streams. You're going to be nymphing, dry fly fishing, and maybe some light streamer fishing, you know, usually on the swing. Most beginners start with what's known as an all-around rod. You know, usually something with a medium fast action that can roll cast an indicator rig, you know, fish a woolly booger on the swing, and adequately cast small dry flies. For your first all-around uh, fly fishing rig, I highly recommend a five weight setup to get you started, especially since 90% of fly fishing consists of uh, using nymph rigs. In my opinion, the Echo Carbon XL 590 is probably the best beginner all around budget fly rod ever made. You know, it costs under $200 and it's extremely forgiving to beginner caster mistakes. In fact, many guide services use this exact rod for their client loaner rods. And it basically does the same thing as the Orvis Clearwater, but it's 60 to $70 cheaper. If later on you want to move up to about, I don't know, a, a $650 budget, $600, $600, $50 budget, um, the Sage Sonic is an excellent all-around fly rod that does everything well. And it's a rod that you can really grow into as you become a better caster and want more performance from a rod. You know, but... As you get more experienced at fly fishing, you're going to eventually drift away from the all-around rod concept, and you'll eventually want a faster rod for indicator and drop shot rigs, you know, a slower, lighter rod for dry flies, and probably a heavier streamer rod. And our next letter is from Delbert from Corpus Christi, Texas. Delbert wrote, I've been a big fan of the 35 Whalen and have watched and enjoyed your videos covering this cartridge extensively. I hope to one day travel to the dark continent to go on safari. I've been contemplating taking my 35 Whalen for planes game. Would you recommend this? Do you have any tips or pointers? Have you used a 35 Whalen in Africa? Thanks for all the great content. Well, the 35 Whalen will make a fantastic planes game cartridge in my opinion you know especially if larger animals like eland are on the list but i've personally never taken a 35 whalen to africa because i've always been wary of traveling with a rifle that needs ammunition that i'll never find abroad if my ammunition gets lost or stolen you know i, I can easily get 30-06 ammo in africa if my ammo doesn't make it to the airport or if it gets stolen while it's there. But you'll never find 35 Whalen on the shelves in Africa. So like most other hunters who vacation to Africa to hunt planes game, I take the boring old 30-06 with me and get boring one-shot kills with that. <laughs> you know, if you travel the world hunting and fishing, you eventually learn one thing. And that's to keep things simple. You know, rookies tend to overcomplicate things on their trips. And when things go bad, they face overcomplicated problems as a result. But, uh, you know, who knows? You know, maybe I'll stop being so conservative and boring. And the next time I go to Africa, you know, which is next year, maybe I'll take a chance and take the 35 whale into the dark continent with me. And our last question is from Clark from Oregon. Clark wrote, Desert Dog, your turkey hunting video was great. My dad is a local expert on turkey hunting and one of the few guys in the county that can go into the woods and almost always walk out with a Merriam's turkey. Last night, I streamed your video on his TV and he was blown away. He said that was the best instruction on turkey hunting he has ever seen. He also said, 
he could tell that you held back a lot of info too. He tells other hunters that Rio turkeys and Merriam turkeys are like hunting two different animals and nobody believes him. Your video validates what my father says. You also said that when the toms are henned up, it's time to change tactics. And my dad agrees and thinks that's why so many people fail at turkey hunting. Thank you for the great content you provide to hunters and anglers on many different topics. Nobody on YouTube is giving us the level of instruction that you provide. Well, what a, what a great letter. But uh, I think you flatter me too much, Clark. By my standards, I'm just not a turkey hunting expert like your father is. You know, turkeys, uh, turkey hunting just never came easy to me. And I have to work my ass off every year to get one. And, you know, I tend to learn things the hard way. And that's the information that I pass on to my viewers. You know, I'm also a keen observer of animals and how they interact with the environment, the weather, and with each other. And when you do that long enough, you start seeing patterns. And when you start seeing these patterns in behavior, you start becoming successful at hunting within that area. You know, there's just no shortcuts to becoming a proficient hunter, especially with turkeys. And when you travel somewhere else and hunt in an unfamiliar area, you become a beginner all over again. And this is the unspoken truth of hunting. Well, that wraps up this month's Hunt Camp Mail. Here's some memes for the month of March. Now, many of you aren't going to like this, but I'm going to scold some of you out there. Many of my own viewers reported my boar snake video to YouTube as inappropriate content because they were triggered by the drawing of a tampon. 
if everything you see offends you and you need a safe space for from bad words and humor, please stop watching my videos. You know, I'd rather you stop watching my videos than report them to YouTube. You know, I, I, I bet these so-called conservatives make fun of liberals who get triggered, not realizing that they're actually looking in the mirror at themselves. YouTube initially demonetized that video and tried to put a strike on my account, which isn't good. But uh, I did fight it, and I actually won, which is rare on YouTube, uh, hunting content creator actually winning a dispute. So I want to thank the leftist woke folks at YouTube for standing up to the right-wing censorship machine. <laughs> I swear, you know, we, we're our own worst enemy sometimes. You guys demand free speech and into censorship, and you criticize YouTube for suppressing gun content. Yet, you're no better than the woke leftists that you hate. So stop being so damn sensitive all the time. You know, most of you would curl up in a little ball and cry if you were around my wife for five minutes. And speaking of my wife, she scolded me because, you know, she had a little bit of coloring put in her hair and she had her hair done at the salon. And apparently I didn't notice it for a while. So I got scolded for that. So in response to that, I shaved off my goatee to see how long it took her to notice. And you know what? It took her just as long. <laughs> but uh, I should be in Montana fly fishing as this video is being released to you. So you might get another fishing video next month. Um, I'll also release a long awaited video on fake hunting experts. And I have another knife video in the works too. So um, I'm really gonna mix up the content next month. You could reach me with any questions or comments at desertdogoutdoors at gmail.com. Thank you for watching and as always, good hunting.